Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you can all see me OK. Um, the remaining talks today are all within the historic city of Gloucester. Um, and the first of these is going to be from Amy Bunce of Border Archaeology. Uh, Amy has a background in environmental archaeology and currently runs the fieldwork side of Border Archaeology. Um, <clears throat> the work relates to the fantastic things that uh, Project Project Pilgrim has been doing at Gloucester Cathedral. Um, just to mention that urban archaeology have been involved in a great deal of recording work inside the cathedral buildings, and that will make a fascinating subject for a future talk. But Amy is today going to talk about the um, works outside the cathedral in the uh, in the close. Um, over to you, Amy. Thank you. Okay, so this is the um, works related to Project Pilgrim at Gloucester Cathedral, so right in the centre of uh, the city. Um, these are excavations that we carried out from 2016 to 2017. Uh, it was part of phase one of Project Pilgrim, which is this heritage lottery funded enhancement of the area. Um, so that was to do the landscaping on the outside of the cathedral. This photo from the top of the roof, you can clearly see the uh, burials that we uncovered and just generally the works going on as they were. So these are, this is the picture you should have seen, the um, burials um, as we were excavating them with the works going on generally. Um, this being a general plan of the area that we were involved in, you know, numbered and lettered as it often is. Uh, you can see the burials in the centre there, the ones that we exposed. Uh, just because there's not burials shown in other areas doesn't mean there aren't any. It just means those are the ones that we were dealing with. Uh, we were dealing with in total 236 articulated skeletons. So ones where the body is still complete, you know, the bones are connected together. We know that um, the person was buried there as a whole. Whether parts of them have been dug away later or not. We also had an awful lot of disarticulated bone. So disconnected bone, bone that was just in fills, bone that wasn't connected together and we couldn't attribute to a single individual. So that would mean there were about 300 um, individuals present. We did lift most of the ones we came across, some of them being at the bottom of our excavations. We didn't need to lift because they weren't going to be impacted. We could cover them up, we could rebury them, leave them where they are originally buried. So this presentation concerns the ones that we were able to lift, the ones that we were able to examine. Um, there were also quite a few ledger stones. So that's the gravestones that lined down. They're not marking a particular grave. So some were recorded and lifted. Others were left where they were because they didn't need to be moved at all. Um, some were just moved a little further away. Some were moved a lot further away. Of the skeletons that we had, the majority were in this area, main excavation area, including a couple of them up in the very top of this picture. So up to the north, underneath the west face of the cathedral. Um, they turned out to be particularly interesting. And then we had 10 or so in other areas where we were just conducting a watching brief. Uh, this main excavation area concerns the lay cemetery. So we know that they're the general population of Gloucester that would have been buried there. Plenty of documentary evidence say that the lay cemetery was on this side of the cathedral. Um, this lay cemetery, it would have been taken in inhumations until about the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they were all have been medieval, post-medieval from the time that the lay cemetery opened. Um, it starts to get disused. It starts to get housing built along the sides of it. Um, and it becomes known as the Upper Churchyard after the dissolution of the monasteries. So the works that I mentioned that weren't included within this main excavation area, um, as part of the watching briefs, we excavated an awful lot of um, tree pits, essentially pits where you can put in an ornamental tree, in particular um, Christmas tree pits to put in particularly nice Christmas trees at Christmas, but they need a big deep hole. And with the burials as they were, we needed to excavate these big deep holes. Our initial works concluded that burials were sometimes 30 centimetres below the surface. So for that reason, 
even a hole for a Christmas tree needs to be excavated and any inhumations removed. So because it's a graveyard, uh, because it's lots of graveyard soil and it's been dug over and dug over quite a lot over the years, you really don't see grave cuts and that sort of thing until you're right on them. You don't see them from the surface, certainly. And you have a lot of finds in amongst this graveyard soil. And this is an example of the finds we had from the graveyard soil. So on the left there, we have quite a few um, jetons and trade and tokens, um, things related to coinage that would have just been lost in this graveyard. Across the top of the screen, uh, two sets of thimbles, which are quite nice, copper alloy thimbles. Not that old, but just interesting to have them in the graveyard soil. Um, top right in the middle, little bone case, um, quite a few bone finds because the middle image is a bone rosary bead. Um, that's the four faces of it. So it's this style of memento mori where you're always reminded of death. So you've got it as a rosary bead that on one side you have the living face, on the other side you have the face of death, that you're always reminded that death comes to all. And that's particularly interesting to find in amongst graveyard soil. Down at the bottom, bone implements of bone pins, um, bone needle cases, really quite um, personal items. They may have been buried with people and become churned up by the soil. They may simply have been lost within the soils. Over on the right-hand side, uh, Romano-British coins, just showing that continuity of use of the soils. It's not just the medieval finds from the medieval cemetery. Um, so we did have a lot of inhumations, but we found a few features, a few walls, and this, the west face of the cathedral, demonstrates them quite well. The large dark purple areas are where we found post hole groups. And these post hole groups are particularly interesting because they're post holes of the size you'd put a very large stake into. And there's a really good suggestion that these post hole groups are the remains of scaffolding. So when the cathedral's being built, ancient scaffolding is going to be a post hole and a large post in the ground to help support that scaffolding. You know, it's not metal poles and plates like it is these days. So that's the suggestion for those post hole groups. And we also have quite a lot of remains of masonry, stone masonry. So we've got the remains of probably the Norman Cathedral underneath the modern Western face. Um, and we have other remains of stone from medieval period. Because there's not much of it, we can't um, make any kind of plans as to how it formed. It's mostly just stones that we can date to certain eras. But particularly interesting in this plan is the wall down at the bottom. So that's the post-medieval wall in a kind of green colour, because that's the wall of the lay cemetery. So this western face, where we didn't really have many inhumations, um, has this lay cemetery wall dividing it from the area that we had the inhumations in. This shows those walls, just that bit more detail. So on the left, the normal walls, the areas where we had these normal walls, and this does show that it is just bits of walls. We can't piece them together and say what it used to look like. It is just fragments of it underneath the modern walls. And then on the right, the remains of the lay cemetery wall. Zoomed out a bit, you can see that it's extending further than just against the cathedral. And it really is dividing the cathedral grounds. Here's the lay cemetery wall again. Um, and particularly interesting on the left, in the middle, you'll be able to see uh, post holes in against the wall. So this is what we mean when we're suggesting. This is what we mean when we're suggesting scaffolding, because just looking at them there, that's the scaffolding support. Throw it up against the wall, get up to some extra height, just as you would with modern scaffolding. Uh, we know about this lay cemetery wall from maps. Uh, Speed's map in particular shows it. So it wasn't unknown that it was there, but it was nice to find it. 
On the right, we can see where we've excavated next to it. And you can see top right that it is not linked to the cathedral itself. It is built up against the cathedral. Um, one of the stones has a mason's mark on the right there. Nothing identifiable, but just the mark that they've built it. In addition to the lay cemetery wall on the western side, we found the wall on the other side, the eastern side, uh, the monk cemetery wall. So it's divided in the lay cemetery from the monk cemetery. This was actually done in a slightly deeper trench, a trial trench, um, trying to put some uh, pipes through as well, because that's where the trench was needed to be dug. And again, nice masonry extending out from the cathedral, um, dividing the cemetery grounds. Um, so going back onto the western side of the cathedral, where we're divided from the lay cemetery, from the main area of interest, um, and underneath the current cathedral building, we have a couple of skeletons, and in particular this skeleton, SK227. Now he's particularly interesting, and it is a he, um, he's particularly interested because he's got no feet, and his feet are actually lying underneath the cathedral. So when they've built the modern, the current cathedral wall, they've truncated its feet away. You can see as well that as they've done that, his lower leg has broken off. So they've taken away his feet on one side and pulled out his leg on the other side. So it is a he. He is over 50 years old. Um, he's particularly interesting because his position suggests some sort of high status. He's close to the original Minster building and the normal abbey has truncated his feet away. He's got no grave goods with him. He's not in a coffin. His head is to the west and he's lying east-west. He's supine. He's almost certainly a Christian. So we've got that about him. He's slightly shorter than the average male for this era. He's 159 centimetres. At that point, the average male, 172. He's slightly shorter. Um, the position that he's in, we were certain that he was earlier than the Norman building. So we're thinking he's Anglo-Saxon. But he was C14 dated, just to confirm that. And the C14 dating completely confirmed that. So that's 951 to 1032 AD. So it's towards the end, Anglo-Saxon period. So he is an Anglo-Saxon, um, buried originally against the Saxon Minster and later cut away to build the Norman building. We, because he's particularly interesting, we also looked at his isotopes. So isotopes given a suggestion as to where he might have been born and where he lived. Well, the ones we looked at, we looked at his teeth enamel. So teeth enamel forming when, when a child's tooth enamel forms um, from about five years to 10 years. What his tooth enamel showed, and that's the chart on the left, is that he does fall into the kind of Gloucester region. Um, he's towards the top of the group that you'd expect for the Gloucester region, but he absolutely falls into that. So at the time that his teeth grew, he was living in the area. Now, the one thing this can't say is whether he's moved away and come back, but generally at the time his teeth grew, he was in the area. What's interesting about him, though, is the smaller chart on the right is his diet. So that's from the carbon isotopes. And he doesn't fall into the groups you'd expect there. His diet is almost suggesting that it's grown in a warmer climate. So that's something that says where he is at the moment. Well, he's buried in Gloucester. So his diet just recently is from a climate warmer than Gloucester. And yet he was in Gloucester as a child. So it's slightly anomalous, but mostly it says that he's not high nobility, come from Europe. Um, and what about his bone conditions in general? Um, he was doing fairly well. Um, he had what you might expect uh, an over 50s man of the Anglo-Saxon period to have. So on the left there, that's part of his sinuses. Um, and it shows... 
there's pitting inside there that shows that he had sinus infections. And that's actually really common. Um, 1.3% of the early medieval population have these sinus infections. And it's, it's seen as rising in the early medieval period. It rises from the kind of Romano-British percentages. And the suggestions are that it's, it's a change to a slightly different um, climate, but mostly it's about ventilation indoors. So it's smoke from cooking, sticking around indoors, people breathing it in continually. Also a bit more industry that they're breathing in that continually. And it's that smoke just getting into their sinuses, causing infection. Um, The result of it is it's going to be a bit discharging. It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to hurt a bit. Um, It's not going to be something he can just go and get some medication to cure. It's going to carry on being an infection. But it's pretty common for his era. Uh, He's got other things going on that are pretty common for his era. He's got some degenerative joint disease. It's about 6% of the population at that point will show that. So the middle picture is showing um, his arm where he's got uh, signs that he's been using it quite a bit. So it's basically arthritis. Um, He's got it in his right elbow. He's got it in his right hand. In fact, in his right hand, he's got it so badly that he doesn't have cartilage at one point. So he's really worn away all his cartilage with how bad his arthritis is. It's probable his shoulder has actually come about as a result of repetitive use. So he's been using his right shoulder continually. And as a result, he's got the arthritis. Um, Also in his back, some of his vertebrae are showing arthritis. But he's 50 years old. He's going to be showing a bit of signs of that sort of thing. Um, his teeth, so over on the right, that's his jaw, that's the top of his mouth. Um, you can see from the yellow on that, his teeth are really worn. Again, it's not uncommon for him of his era to have teeth that worn. He's got quite a lot of um, tooth decay and gum disease. <laughs> Again, totally um, normal. Actually, all of his gums are infected and have, the bone has started to reabsorb. So when we go to the dental hygienist these days and they tell us, oh, you know, clean your teeth better or your gums will start to absorb. Well, this is happening to him because he hasn't been cleaning his teeth. Um, He's lost three of his teeth completely. Uh, You can't see it in that jaw section there, but three of his teeth have gone completely. Um, And that's simply related to his lack of dental hygiene. He has a few holes of decay. So... He's started to get a bit of sugar into his diet and his teeth have started to decay. Um, Particularly interesting about his teeth is that he has some lines on them called hyperplasia that show that he had a stressful incident at the point that that tooth was growing. So these lines suggest that when he was about four or five years old, he had a stressful time. Now, whether that was um, a prolonged period of malnutrition, whether it was a disease is not completely clear, but he did recover from it. He clearly recovered and lived many, many years, but it's left that mark on his teeth that when he was four or five, um, he had a disease enough that stressed his body enough to leave a mark on his teeth. So that's our Anglo-Saxon buried beneath the cathedral, who was particularly interesting, but we found plenty of other skeletal remains as well, all with their own stories to tell. Um, and mostly in this main excavation area. Uh, so there they are. So someone else who would be particularly interested in would be, well, these are the ones that are particularly interested in. I'm going to talk about 15 of them. One of them in particular was this one, number 35. Now, top left, there's not much left of him there. Um, it's because he's in the graveyard. Um, he's just lost some of his bones, probably through other graves being dug, that sort of thing. This one is a man. Um, What's particularly interesting about him is that he's got an amputated leg. It's one, the the leg that you see there is not the amputated one. It's his right leg that's been amputated. It's been amputated just below the knee. And the pictures in the middle do show the position it's been amputated. It's been well healed. There's no sign of infection. So it's been cut cleanly and healed nicely. 
in fact, it's happened so long ago that the two leg bones have fused together since. Um, and it's happened so long ago and he's not used his leg so much since that uh, the bones started atrophy as well. So it's really shown that it's been a long condition that he's had. What's particularly interesting is that the remains of his prosthetic leg were found. So there's a metal band there and I'll show pictures of it in a sec. Um, with traces of bone and wood on it. So he's got essentially a peg leg that he's been buried with. Because of this uh, prosthetic leg, he's it's obviously affected his walk. Um, his left arm is really, really muscular. So the joints of the muscles onto the bones are particularly pronounced. Um, and that really strongly suggests that he's been using a crutch on that arm. So he's lost his right leg and he's got a crutch on his left side to help get around. But this is a long existing injury. He's had that crutch for a really long time. He's developed incredible muscles as a result. His prosthetic bow, uh, we sent it away to get cleaned up and it came out really incredibly actually from the corroded crusty lump it was originally. So you can see the metal band, you see the belt buckle, you can see the rather large nails associated with it. And because we've basically only got the metal, we haven't got the organics associated with it. We can't completely work out how it worked, but it is clear that this metal band is holding wood. So the metal band's got nails in it. We've got traces of wood and that's the two photos up the top right is the mineralized wood next to the metal. So that happens when you get wood next to metal, that it's just a bit of a chemical reaction going on. You can get some of the wood preserved that's immediately next to the metal. Um, so it's probably a wooden peg leg that he's got. Next to the buckle though, we have traces of bone. So that's the second two photos just below the trace of wood, mm. that there's trace of bone against the buckle. So he's got some kind of, um, bone decoration or use where the buckle goes as part of his peg leg. So he's got a wooden peg leg um, that he's been buried with. He's had it really long time of his life. Um, and he's, he's managed very well. So that's him. Our next interesting skeleton is um, a bit of a fighter. So he's, he's uh, number six there, very just above number five. So, We've pretty much got his upper parts there. He's got um, brick wall but built where his lower parts are. Um, he is a he. He's a fairly young he, 25, 35, kind of normal height. Um, but the reason I say he's a fighter is because of the muscle attachments on his arms, um, particularly his upper arms, lower arms. And... That is matched with a few breaks, healed breaks. Um, one of those breaks is very indicative that he's punched a hard object. Another break is really indicative that he's thrown a punch. So not necessarily that he's um, made contact with something, but certainly that he's thrown a punch. Um, so he's had a fight, he's healed from it. Next one to look at would be this one who's also had a bit of fighting going on. Um, he's been kicked. So his ribs are he all healed, but he's got 14 rib fractures showing that he's been kicked at some point. Um, also a man. <laughs> um, bit more violence going on. Another man here, 112. He's got a healed blade wound to his skull. Um, it's, it's well healed, but he's been hit by a bladed implement. Uh, this guy has not suffered from violence, but I think you can see from the photos the curvature of his spine. Um, scoliosis, normally a disease from birth, could be as a result of trauma, but um, he's lived to a good old age, 45, and he's lasted that through his life. Another guy who's had a bit of um, an incident in life, but got on with it, really bad leg here. So he's got some other healed fractures, but in this case, 
this is probably an ankle fracture that's um, open. So the, the bone's been open through the skin and it's got infected and got lots of more bone growth there. So that wouldn't have been very pleasant for him. And the level of infection, I mean, it's been healing, but would that have led to his death? This one has healed. This broken leg has healed, but not very well. It's not been splinted. It's ended up basically forming another joint. Um, this, this actually is not a lab. This is a lady, but she's showing signs of tuberculosis. So again, really common. Breathing issues in that area it led to TB. And another really common um, disease to see, syphilis. So this is a man showing signs of syphilis because of his extra growth of, um, his ex that's actually not the right photo of his bones there, but he does have extra growth on his bones. Um, three slides to show now that feature uh, children. So just, if you don't want to see them, just step away for a moment. Um, this is a lady who, that's a full-term fetus. Um, the fetus is actually shown signs of infection and has lost its arm. It's a strong suggestion that it's tried to be removed. Um, there's cut marks on her, cut marks on the fetus and it's lost its arm. So trying to save the woman's life, trying to remove the fetus hasn't worked. She's ended up dying. Childhood diseases. This child is showing signs of, this child is 135. This child is showing signs of scurvy. Um, there's a good chance he's died from scurvy. Uh, I, actually, I don't know if he on that one, but he's just a child. And this child has shown signs of rickets. So there's his leg bones being very, very bowed. It's a good sign of rickets. These um, do have pathologies on them, but the interesting thing about these next two skeletons is the coffins. So in this case, the studs that are in the coffin, um, They've been preserved, fallen in on top of the chest. And you can see an F and a H and probably two other letters, one that's slightly circular. With this next coffin plate also being very decorative and has fallen in on the skeleton, um, formed out of upholstery tacks. And you can kind of see the letters that would have been there in the pattern. Um, so generally, what are we seeing about these uh, burials? We're seeing that um, the location they were in, this was probably quite a lot of affluent um, people. They've got coffins. Some of them have been brick lined. Um, the males and females, there's no difference in the level of affluence. We mostly have adults. Um, in fact, the infant mortality is really underrepresented because it's mostly adults. Um, the ladies are mostly of an average height. The men tend to be mostly tall. They show signs of tobacco use. They show signs of sinus infections. They show plenty of tooth loss and tooth decay. And they show plenty of healed traumatic injuries. Um, I mean, they all have stories, but those are the ones that the, their stories have left a mark on their bone. And then finally, they've been put back in the ground. So just underneath the cellarage um, on the cathedral close is an area where all these 300 remains have been reburied. Um, given a service by Canon Richard Mitchell. Um, and they are now back resting where they were originally buried. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was fascinating, if uh, slightly gruesome on occasion. Um, hopefully people have got lots of questions about that. Please feel free to carry on putting them in the uh, Q&A box. 